the way IPI sees ourselves is that we are a technology enabler. Uh, when the innovation comes into the picture for them to integrate. Uh, many people think that integration of technology is easy. It's not. It's challenging. As we know, there are three types of uh, open innovation. That is what innovation is about. And that's the beauty about open innovation, leveraging on each other's strength. And for every sector, there will be own, uh, let's say, generative AI. Yeah. Try not to be emotional. Uh, yeah. Try to be rational. Um, I always try to go back to the basics. My guest for today's podcast is Michael Gaw. Michael serves as the Chief Operating Officer of IPI. IPI is a subsidiary of Enterprise Singapore and functions as an innovation catalyst. In simple terms, it offers companies and uh, enterprises of Singapore and Southeast Asia the opportunity to access the global innovation ecosystem. Michael joined the company from its first days and he is one of the foremost pioneers who have been actively involved in the company's development. In the podcast, I will discuss with him how the innovation catalyst works, how the technology development and the, the innovation landscape are evolving in Singapore and Southeast Asia. We'll also discuss and delve into the challenges faced by top managers and leaders, talent retention in the country, the role of immigrants in the innovation sector, and new emerging technologies that will shape our future. Please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. Uh, thank you, Michael, for today's podcast. Thank you for coming over. And uh, I'm sure we can make a very interesting discussion today about innovations, about collaboration mm -hmm. of uh, companies with startups and beyond. Thank you for having me, Baha. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, I, I hope we'll, I'm sure we'll have a good conversation. Yes. Okay. So... The question that I would like to start with, of course, uh, about IPI, and which was uh, founded in 2011, and uh, it catalyzes innovation by connecting SMEs, mm -hmm. like small to medium enterprises, uh, with startups and uh, corporates and bigger companies. Uh, could you please give us with a broader overview of how an Innovation Catalyst uh, works? Sure. Um, so, as an Innovation Catalyst, is a, it's a very interesting role. Um, the word, you know, everybody get hang up with the word innovation, but actually, uh, as an Innovation Catalyst and a, a middleman, what we try to do, we attempt to do, is to work with companies, especially the local enterprises, uh, particularly the small, medium enterprises, to work with the business owner to address uh, business needs so that they can grow their top line and how do we help them is really looking at how can innovation and technology help them move their business into a new either create a new opportunity in terms of a new product differentiate product and so that they can grow their top line so that is the role of an intermediary that you know IPI has been playing in yeah that's great that's great uh, we see a lot of um outcomes from IPA definitely so but I believe it was not easy to start a company like IPA at, from the beginning from the scratch right but you are one of the let's say uh, managing uh, let's say directors and managers uh, who joined uh, to the IPI starting from the beginning mm -hmm. so I, I believe it's from 2011 right so what were the challenges that IPA encountered in its early years and how did you and your team like manage to solve them thanks thanks Baha, for asking that uh, it's a uh, it brings back a lot of memories uh, so when IPI first started it was uh, just four people I'm one of them um, I think for the kind of uh, business that IPI is in um, it is what we call credence services meanings um, because we are the middle person trying to connect technology seekers to technology owners, 
the the perennial question, the question always come up again and again in this kind of business is, why should businesses trust an intermediary, <clears throat> a middleman like IPI? So the first thing IPI had to do is to demonstrate through very tangible way that we can be trusted and then we are credible in delivering outcomes. So the first five years was uh, very challenging. Now looking back, uh, we spent a lot of time talking to people, gaining their trust, um, and then through delivering outcomes, we are slowly, slowly we gain the, the credibility and, and people start to come to IPN and say, okay, I, I, I want to try you out. I want to work with you in technology scouting project. So it was a long uh, gestation period, if I may call it. It's a long business that we took. And uh, now we are 12 years plus. So a lot of the hard work was done in the early years, but there is always room for improvement. So we are constantly, as a company, we are constantly trying to evolve, trying to you know improve ourselves, better our services for our clients. Thank you, thank you. That's great. So yeah, 12 years is a long uh, period of time yeah. for companies. I'm sure you have uh, encountered uh, many problems and you solved and then you see the progress now uh, since you joined from the beginning, you have a bigger picture. So how IPA has, IPA has involved uh, in uh, innovation uh, catalyst, not only in Singapore, right? It's yeah. beyond Singapore. Yeah. So um, how do you describe the progress usually uh, annually for IPI? So for IPI, I think what we do, especially in the space of innovation, it's it's a very long haul business. So the the role that IPI plays is we are constantly trying to work with companies in their innovation journey. So for the first uh, five years of IPI's history, we focus primarily on working with companies who are looking for technology. And then as we progress, we gain their trust, we start to be involved in their longer term strategy, particularly companies who are interested to involve us in their innovation uh, strategy, innovation map. They involve us in the discussion and they start to trust us and start to share their long-term view with IPI and say, hey, these are certain areas I want to go into. Can you help me keep a lookout for relevant technology, best fit technology through your network? So the evolution of IPI has evolved as we go and we sort of grow with our clients. And as we grow, we, we start to uh, understand our clients better. Uh, they have gaps and we try within our means, given our resources, to fill those gaps. So when IPI first started, we start out with just technology scouting, uh, tech expert scouting. In 2020, 2019, we start to evolve. We start to say, hey, how about providing innovation advisory to uh, small medium enterprises? So we pull together, as of now, we have a 30 innovation advisors. These are semi-retired industry veterans who are coming in to say I you know they provide uh, advisory to companies to evolve their business model and these are industry veterans are uh, bilingual they understand business they understand technology so they try to marry technology with business model to bring these SMEs to a higher level to increase their top line through adopting innovation. So that's the evolution of IPI and, and uh, we constantly see ourselves as a startup. So every five years, we have to refresh ourselves. I think the key thing, like all businesses, we want to remain relevant to our client and we want to value it. We want to create impact for our client. So IPI is forever. I always tell my colleague, we are forever a work in progress. Yeah, that's great. So IPI is, uh, uh, has a dynamic workplace, right? So you, you meet... Um, different companies from different sectors and uh, you you see you collaborate and you you see their journey you see their collaboration uh integration of new technologies mm -hmm. to their businesses and you see their progress which is quite interesting as well to be involved and uh, that's great so one of the uh key questions that we i would like to understand like what are the main areas of innovation that IPI focuses on the most? 
It's a very good question, Bao, and I get asked uh, very often on this. Um, IPI, as you know, is funded by the Singapore government. So there is a certain focus on uh, IPI where we align ourselves uh, to national uh, strategic uh, directions. So case in point, I think we all know in Singapore, we talk about this uh, food security 30 by 30. So that is one area of uh, focus that IPI is looking into. Uh, we're not just looking at just food manufacturing. We, in, fact, uh, in fact, yesterday, my colleague has put together a, uh, a workshop and, and a sort of a outreach event where we look at the farm to fork, meaning the whole dimension of bringing from farm produce to the table. And this particular uh, outreach event and networking event, a technology matchmaking event, uh, the focus was on uh, agri-plant, uh, sorry, agri-food uh, site stream virilization because we see that is the next thing uh, that could be opportunity for many companies because there's a lot of food waste being produced. Um, I've been constantly reminded by my colleague not to use the word food waste, <laughs> uh, which I should yeah. use site stream. So that is one area. The other area that we also focus on is the digitalization because that is something that uh, is prevalent. So we do look in technology. Companies do come to us uh, to look for relevant technology in this area. So in the other very big area that we also uh, trying to grapple with is sustainability. It's a very big word. It's a very, very big topic. So we are, at this point in time, we are... Uh, working with various companies who are interested in this topic on sustainability and we're trying to sense the ground what are the relevant technology that Singapore companies are looking at because we're dealing with small medium enterprises. So their needs in terms of uh, and opportunity in the sustainability area can change. So this is an area, uh, these are the three main areas we look at. Of course, we do look at uh, material, uh, material science. We do work uh, with companies in the personal care uh, healthcare area as well, and of course, uh, automation in terms of manufacturing. So it's a rather broad portfolio, uh, but the way IPI sees ourselves is that we are a technology enabler and we see ourselves playing across different sectors and we want to use technology to address the business need of those sectors. Yeah, that's great. So these sectors definitely uh, defines uh, companies' future, right? So SMEs, uh, they are uh, different than large corporates and in, uh, large companies. Mm -hmm. So they have, uh, let's say, limited uh, uh, resources in terms of finance, mm -hmm. in terms of manpower. Yeah. So when they come, uh, when the innovation comes into the picture for them to integrate, mm -hmm. uh, are they uh, eager to integrate as soon as possible or they just start slowly by testing in a small uh, scale and over time they increase their let's say um, acceptance of the mm -hmm. new innovation yeah. so it's it's uh so Baha, you 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 hit the nail on the head uh, smes uh, they are resource strapped so when we work with smes we really try to first understand our client their business first yeah. and then we look at what are the kind of problems that they are trying to solve? Is this near-term issues or is this something that they have a bit of time for them to wreck? Now, if it is a very near-term challenge that they are trying to address using technology, we will try to find technology that are of a higher readiness level. Typically, what we try to do is we find technology that is from another SME so that when you have two business work together, and they can react, they can pair with each other much faster. So that will help to mitigate some of the uh, go-to-market challenges that uh, SME faced when you're dealing with technology. Uh, many people think that integration of technology is easy. It's not. It's challenging. So this is the reason why when I said we try to pair them up with higher readiness technology is to try to mitigate that risk. For SMEs who are a bit having a bit more runway and they say that, oh, this is something my client is looking for, not immediately, maybe 12 months down the road or maybe 18 months down the road, which is also a very long time for SME. Then we, we start to have a deeper conversation with them. Uh, we said, okay, what is you know the kind of resources available for you? Uh, what is 
the plan? Do you want to own the IP? You know, how do you want to commercialize this IP? So once we have this kind of better understanding of where they want to go and the risk appetite of the project, then we will try to find a technology that can best fit those requirements. It may come from another SMEs, or it could come from a startup who is keen to work with another partner, or it could come from higher institute of learning research. So. We try to find a best fit solution that suits our clients' need. Thanks for the uh, detailed explanation. So, as you said, SMEs collaborate with SMEs. Yes. Um, when we are talking about uh, small and medium enterprises, they are more or less established companies, mm -hmm. and when they collaborate, the risk of uh, let's say failure is is less probably yeah. uh, compared to startups. Mm -hmm. So, when SMEs they want to incorporate, they want to uh, integrate uh, technology from uh, startup companies. Is it uh, different? Uh, do Are they more uh, stringent on integration of technologies from startups compared to other SMEs or they are similar? I think I, I'm, I'm just reminding myself not to make a very sweeping statement yeah. uh, because each technology is different. Um, it depends on, I, I don't think it's fair to put it such that uh, all startups are the same, they are not. Some startups are yeah. more mature because the founders are very experienced and they have a better understanding of how to project manage, how to mitigate the risk when working with a third party yeah. or another party. So it, it all depends on the two parties that uh, we are working with. So as a responsible, trusted partner of our client, what we try to do is to understand both parties in terms of what they want and what are the other party that is the technology owner, what are they capable of doing. And so what we do is we manage the expectations of both parties. And of course, while the seekers and the owners come together, they establish the commercial arrangement among themselves. So what IPI try to do many times is when we see that there are potential pitfalls, we gently nudge both parties and say, hey, have you considered this as part of your execution plan? Uh, perhaps you might want to look at in doing some of these tests that could be in compliance to what regulator wants if they overlook them. Uh, perhaps sometimes we say that, hey, your timeline, do you think is a bit too aggressive? Do you want to put in a little buffer so that you can has, have at least two to three iteration? So that is the role that IPI plays and we value it to the conversation. So um, it's complicated because every SME and every startup, they are very different. It's just like human. Yeah. We are all different. We are our strengths and weaknesses. Right, so right. as an intermediary, we have to find ways to manage and ex the expectation of both parties. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's really uh, interesting. So that how uh, SMEs and startups, yeah. they, they collaborate and... Uh, they de risk the the collaboration yeah. and uh, adoption of the new technologies. Mm -hmm. So um, when we talk about um, IPI, one of the key areas uh, that you the IPI always uh, tries to address is uh, open innovation. Yeah. So as we know, there are three types of uh, open innovation. So outside in, uh, which means inbound knowledge flow, and uh, inside out outbound knowledge flow as we know open innovations as well as there is a coupled open innovations like combining knowledge of inflow and the outflows yeah. of the innovation so which type of open innovation is currently common among ipi involved companies and uh, uh, let's say uh, corporations I'm, I'm smiling because we actually do all three that's um, great yeah um <laughs> Very often, we, if the client is new to us, it tends to be inbound, meaning they're looking for solution, they're looking for technology coming into them. As we get to know some of these SME better and better, we start to realize that they themselves have technology, have knowledge, they have, and if they express the desire to uh, commercialize or monetize these uh, intellectual properties, then it becomes outbound. 
So mm-hmm. they become the source of technology for others. Okay. And the uh, and then of course when you we bring both parties together uh, to collaborate, it becomes a mix of both. Because when two persons talk, just like what we are doing now, we will generate ideas. We will conceive new foreground IP. So that there, there is always this interplay of in and out, in and out, and that is what innovation is about. And that's the beauty about open innovation: leveraging on each other's strength to complement each other. You know, so cover each other's weaknesses using each individual strength, so that as a whole you become better. Okay, that's great. So thanks for the detailed answer. It's very interesting to know that how IPI is working in the open innovation right. uh, area. So. Uh, since the beginning of IPA, so open innovation landscape has it changed, evolved, or it is relatively similar as before. Um, so open innovation, it's it's a term coined by uh, academic uh, Henry Chesbrough. Yeah, but I think the, the the reality about the working with SMEs, SME has been practicing open innovation for the longest of time because SME do not have all the resources. They are forced by circumstances to work with others. Now, working with others really means uh, leveraging on the strength of others. So they have always been operating in an open innovation mode for the longest of time. It's just that many of them do not realize it. So if you ask me, has that uh, landscape changed? I would say no as in terms of businesses. But the use of this word open innovation has become more prevalent. Then I think the key evolution that we see is the nuances involved in using open innovation as a business model. Th- what I mean by nuances, these are the things about uh, SMEs being able to uh, handle the issues of foreground IP, commercialization of foreground IP. So that is an area of gap that some uh, SME who was not familiar with adopting technology will stumble and that is where IPI can value add by sharing our knowledge with them, how they can navigate some of these uh, nuances in IP, foreground IP management. Yeah, I see, I see. So the, how risky is outside in open innovation for startups that are working with, let's say, uh, larger companies like uh, SMEs, which has uh, like uh, tens and... Um, hundreds of workers like a team mm. uh, yeah so I, I think when we are talking about outside in uh, 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 innovation is a t- uh, innovation is from uh, the SM, the startups uh, beyond the startups uh, you know the, the doors and they're adopting technology from someone else I think there are, there are few, few things that uh, startups should be aware of one is they have to be very clear of their own background IP Mm-hmm. What do they want to keep? Yep. What is core to their business? Because many startups build on a foundation of a core set of IP. Yep. Um, the, the first concern will be if these are the core IP that they want to keep, what is the risk of so-called uh, contamination? Meaning, mm-hmm. if you interact with another party and you do not have a strict uh, IP policy in terms of, for example, NDA, uh, you do not have a strict uh, policy of how you handle jointly created foreground IP. Many startups can end up having problems because if you interact with another technology owner and you have this kind of conversation, yeah. inevitably yeah. new IP will be created. Then the question of how do you handle this foreground IP? Yeah. Who has the rights to commercialize it? Uh, you know what is the cost sharing model? What are the costs involved? And often people will forget that besides the talking about sharing of profits, how about the maintenance cost? How about the cost of fighting litigation should that happen? Yeah, yeah. So these are all the nuances that uh, many startups may uh, not be familiar with. Yeah. But I, I think increasingly over the years, I've also seen more and more startups are becoming more and more sophisticated. Uh, they have good uh, advisors that can advise them in this area. So these are things that I think for outside in uh, innovation that uh, you know if you're going on that model, you should be aware of. I think the other part is the practical side of things is project management. How do you manage uh, schedule slippage, yeah. uh, scope creep? 
Yeah. Um, and these are things that as a startup, especially when you have very limited resources, yeah. you really have to take care of this. And I think the other thing is not to overpromise. Manage the expectations of your client. Yeah. Um, do what you can. And um, I typically always tell them, tr- try to underpromise but over deliver. I think that always works. Yes, yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. For startups, um, from your experience, or would you suggest to be involved in open innovation from the beginning? Or do you think they should uh, exist as a company for a few years, start generating some revenue, and after that, starting to explore open innovation with other companies? I don't really have a fixed... In my mind, I don't have a fixed model for when. I think it's the, the readiness of the management team what is their business strategy? Yeah. Um, if right from the onset they they are designing the business model based on working with others, then they can go ahead to work with others right from the start, from the beginning. But if they are leveraging on, on some core IP that they want to keep for themselves and they are building this in-house and these core IPs are at a very nascent stage of development and... Then in those kind of situations, I would rather advise the, the startup to seriously, seriously um, keep the IP to themselves, work on their own first, get themselves ready, understand what are the client's needs and try to uh, design or develop a, a solution that addresses the client's needs before they talk to a third party. Because working with a third party can mess things up very, uh, in a very nasty way if you do not uh, manage them properly. Yeah. Right, right. I agree. I agree. Thank you uh, for the suggestions for, for startups. And uh, as you know, for any innovation and uh, for overall for the country, yeah. uh, when it comes to uh, create something new, uh, design something new to make it uh, workable. So you need, uh, let's say, uh, people who are m- energetic, uh, willing to, uh, let's say, commit their uh, time and energy to deliver uh, very good uh, solutions Mm -hmm. to the existing problems in the society. And uh, although in certain cases, in some countries, including Singapore, um, there there are some uh, arising problems like, uh, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but uh, it's good to know that the population is uh, aging mm-hmm. as part of the let's say national family planning campaign mm-hmm. from singapore the two child family policy mm-hmm. was introduced to in singapore in 2000 i mean uh, 1972 uh, since then the total let's say fertility rate uh, has dropped from 3.07 to 1.4 mm-hmm. a rate that is well below the replacement level of let's say 2.1 mm-hmm. As a result, this had led to population aging and then <coughs> labor force shortages and increasing early uh, elderly dependency ratios and so on. So uh, when it comes to, uh, let's say, innovation and uh, commitment, you mostly see the people who are relatively younger uh, has uh, more energy mm. to commit, mm. to deliver, mm. uh, outcomes in terms of innovation Mm -hmm. which uh, needs a lot of um, dedication right so how is uh, this let's say the aging population affecting the innovation landscape overall in singapore it's a very interesting question that you have there um it is without a doubt i think many developed countries face the same challenge that singapore faced yeah, the yeah, the reproduction rate is not uh, catching up with the mortality rate. It's it's a real challenge. So I, I think we as a, uh, people, I think it's about people, we need to realize this and we need to be very open-minded. Um, if we are closing our mind and not wanting to bring in talents outside to come in, then it's a zero-sum game. Eventually, we will lose. Yeah. So yeah. if you ask me, whether the uh, aging population challenge is, is going to go away, it won't go away. I think the key thing is be very open-minded, look at individuals for their strength, 
And if they fit into the model that a uh, company is looking for, I think we should be open-minded. Uh, for example, IPI, we, we have uh, colleagues who are from Australia. Yeah. Um, John, is, is, it's an excellent example and it's, he has his strength in his own areas and we love working with him. We tap into his strength. The question about uh, working with older folks and the younger ones, without a doubt, when you're young, you're very dynamic. I also know many older people who are at the age of 60s and 70s, yeah. they are even more dynamic than the young ones. <laughs> so the advantage of old yeah. people is, is the older people are... They, they have wealth of experience. Yes, yes. They have been there, done it. I, I think this is something that we should, the, uh, should tap into yeah, because yeah. They, could f- they have experienced uh, life. They have seen things yeah. um, and they have solutions. Yeah. They may not have the perfect solutions. Right, right. But so we should in- bring them in to have the conversation and say, hey, you know, I want to tap into your experience. Yeah. And for people who are a bit more uh, older, I think... We also have to be mindful that the young ones have new ideas. They're fresh ideas and we should embrace those fresh ideas and not write them off right from the start. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very common phenomenon and I, I think uh, in many organizations, even in IPI, we love having uh, fresh ideas. We love to yeah. have people who are not from our fraternity join us because they inject new ideas. Yeah, yeah. So okay, that's 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 clear. So um, so older generation, they have uh, a lot of experience. Yeah. Uh, they have a enormous background, yeah. and which is very important. Yeah. And uh, but they need uh, younger, let's say, generation, who uh, has a capacity to learn from them. Yes. And continue yeah. the innovation mm-hmm. uh, and the improvement of the uh, let's say. Uh, landscape of uh, innovation technology development yeah. right so yeah. as, uh, from your experience uh, you see that younger generation is also uh, coming in a regular let's say rate as before yeah. and then they are also committed in uh, making these changes in innovation and technology development right so yes. uh, they are learning from the older generation yeah. and uh, there is a very let's say, a uh, collaborative way of making this happen, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think the advantage of having uh, experienced people around is, is th- one thing I observe is they have networks that the younger ones may not have. You can tap into that and yeah. to solve many problems very quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because we are human, you know, yeah. we, we like to relate to people we know. So that is definitely one advantage having uh, see you know, more senior people, so as to speak, very experienced. Yes. Um, and they have their own very good connections and it opened many doors. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that is something uh, younger people should really uh, work with the older folks when, you know, this is something they can leverage upon. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's very interesting. Uh, so uh, when, when we talk about the aging population, uh, one of the key areas that comes into the picture is healthcare. Yeah. So do you notice any shifts in the innovation and investment in these areas, especially towards age-related health issues and longe- longevity, for example? Yeah. Uh, do you see like uh, the startups uh, uh, being born uh, and then emerging and then starting to do more uh, innovations towards healthcare? Uh, is there any... Um, are there m- many startups these days compared to early, uh, let's say, years of IPI in right. this area? So interestingly, um, actually, we I, I sort of observed this um, digitalization of healthcare um, due to COVID. Because mm-hmm. COVID forced everyone to do a reset, rethink of the way we do things. Yeah. Uh, because of the need to be isolated for yeah. safe and health reasons during COVID, Digital technology becomes very interesting. It becomes, it pushes the boundary. Um, in the past, uh, you know, people are not so receptive about remote healthcare and so on and so forth. Yeah. But increasingly, people are realizing that, hey, th- that kind of technology works. It's a necessity. So in, in Singapore context, we know that our hospitals, uh, are, you know, we have good hospitals. Uh, but however, you, as the aging, you know, as the population age, 
you need more and more hospitals. Then yeah. you have you you don't want to have a situation where you have everybody in the hospital. So we are talking about getting people out of the hospital as they can, and then have home care by leveraging on IoT sensors, digital technology. Such kind of home care becomes possible, and I'm seeing that this is an increasing trend uh, that is coming up. Uh, it's a matter of getting this technology tested out, make them robust, and get accepted by you know the medical and the healthcare fraternity. It's definitely coming, mm-hmm. and if you extrapolate from Singapore context to a larger context, because Singapore is a small city state, yeah. it's we are very small physically, uh, geographically. It's very easy to you know have someone a nurse turn up at the door, mm-hmm. but if you extrapolate and you look in a bigger countries like in Australia, yeah. people are living so far apart. Then such solutions become commercially very viable mm-hmm. if you find uh, the right sweet spot to go into, uh, understanding the healthcare and the insurance structure in those country, and then yeah. those are business opportunity. Yeah, that's great. So you see, for example, some. Uh, international, let's say, companies uh, who would like to work, let's say, from Australia mm-hmm. with Singapore companies yeah. who are providing such solutions in healthcare. Do you see this kind of uh, collaboration going on? There are definitely in- increasing interest in this space, mm-hmm. right? And I see this as opportunities. And it's not just Australia, yeah. but as yeah. you we look at the surrounding region, right? Uh, region. You know, Southeast Asia. You know, uh, for example, our neighbor. Indonesia is a huge country, yes. and then people, are, you know, some people live in in not in cities but in the in outskirts and in, even in the yeah. you know farms area. So they will need healthcare. Yeah, but then definitely. this kind of technology becomes av- readily ab- available, and they will be able to address the healthcare needs of this kind of very remote uh, villages, for example. So I I see this as opportunities, and it's definitely something and an, an opportunity for. Um, companies who wish to enter this area. Yeah, thank you for for the detailed explanation. In fact, Singapore, we can see that as a um, developed country, it is uh, providing a lot of solutions uh, in healthcare to neighboring countries, uh, to developing countries in Southeast Asia. So when it comes to the uh, innovation, is not surprised that. Uh, immigrants has a big influence in developing uh, innovation and technologies in countries like US, for example, and developed countries. So, for example, around 35% of the innovation in the United States, it comes from the immigrants. And uh, those people who, uh, let's say, uh, migrated from other part of the world. And then it uh, drives the economy. Uh, it helps to the economy uh, development and uh, technological advancements. So within the innovation and technology development areas of Singapore, do you notice a similar trend? Do you see a lot of, uh, let's say, immigrants, uh, people who come to Singapore and they make changes in innovation landscape? Definitely, I think uh, people from different countries coming together, they bring with them their wealth of knowledge. Uh, they bring together different perspectives, so we come into the the ecosystem where we co-create. I think it it adds more color, and if you are from a different country, you bring in your experience from, and you also bring in the pain points that is from another different setting. So when it comes to innovation, we are trying to solve problems, and having knowledge of those different uh, nuances in different countries, different ecosystem. Actually helps to make the innovation uh, landscape here more exciting, more relevant. Actually, the keyword is really more relevant yeah. because at yeah. the end of the day, innovation is to solve a set of problems, yeah. and having a more relevant solutions would definitely help. Yeah, uh, definitely. So um, I would like to ask some uh, questions on smart nation initiatives, mm-hmm. actually, right. which is uh, very important, for example, for Singapore's uh, landscape in terms of uh, technology and innovation. So Smart Nation Singapore refers to the government's vision and yeah. initiative to leverage technology and data to improve the quality of life, yeah. enhance connectivity and drive economic growth 
in Singapore. Mm. It aims to transform Singapore into technologically advanced and digitally connected nation. Mm. Initiatives are based on so uh, three key pillars: so digital economy, like digital government, and the digital society. How is the digitalization affecting to the operation and functionality of IPI, uh, as well as it is uh, its technology scouting strategies? Right. Yeah, with digital technology, it, it opens up many opportunities. Um, we, from IPI perspective, we have always been trying to look for tools, uh, software tools that can help us find. Uh, relevant technology for our clients in the fastest, more effective manner. Uh, we are seriously looking at how we can leverage on uh, AI technology to do this part of the scan to identify relevant technology. Uh, ChatGPT is a very exciting development. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's something that we have been looking at. We are paying very close attention. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at as of now, uh, the digital technologies that are available now. Um, at least available to IPI, we we don't see something that can uh, replace a human. So we still need uh, people on t- two legs, t- uh, my colleagues, to do some of these tech scouting works because um, marrying business and innovation it's much more complicated. You need a human behind it. So that is something we're paying very close attention. On more of our operational day-to-day operations, we do leverage a lot on some of this digital technology to draw insights uh, to, for example, visitors who visit our IPI's in uh, virtual marketplace, which is our website. Uh, the kind of uh, click rates they have on our technology offers, uh, the inquiries they make, what are their interests. So we draw all these kind of uh, insights from analyzing the data. So these are digital technology that we are using ourselves. Uh, internally, we, we we use various digital tools for collaborative work. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, we are trying to, uh, we are in the midst of um, uh, evaluating several technology that can enable the team to work collaboratively and to retain knowledge. So if you ask me, digital uh, tools, digitalization, it has to be a DNA of uh, a technology company like IPI. So it's definitely something that is very helpful for, to us. Yes, and mm. is technology and then uh, new new ones like as you said AI based tools. Yeah. They are now is very uh, like uh, involved in many companies, yeah. including IP as as you explained. Yeah. And um, we see that trend is um, uh, significantly increasing, yeah. Yeah. and uh, application of artificial intelligence AIs. Yeah. Um, very uh, uh, intensive these days. Yeah. Uh, we see the lately the this year uh, it uh, uh, spiked suddenly uh, after ChatGPT. Now yes. a lot of companies and startups are building yeah. uh, similar solutions. Yeah. I think recently, uh, let's say Mark Zuckerberg, uh, founder of Facebook and Meta, he explained mm-hmm. that for every uh, area and for every sector. There will be own, uh, let's say, generative AI, yeah. uh, and uh, it's one of the areas. For example, these days companies are uh, developing generative AI solutions is uh, surprisingly management. So, <laughs> for example, in uh, August of uh, last year, uh, a so-called um, uh, Tang Yu, an AI-powered virtual humanoid robot. Mm-hmm. Let's say was appointed as the CEO of the Chinese company Net Dragon <laughs> <laughs> Websoft. The new CEO is uh, so now is responsible for examining the high level right. statistics, yeah. which is important for the uh, company companies making leadership decisions. So AI decides what to do, which is very interesting. Uh, they evaluate the AI evaluates uh, risks. Uh, and a nurturing and effective workspace. There are few other companies are now, um, let's say, trying to incorporate and integrate such solutions, like a digital, let's say, CEO for for the for their for their companies. 
So do you think uh, generative AI will replace, let's say, executive officers overall? I'm rather skeptical, not because uh, I'm a, a CEO of IPI. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the senior <laughs> management. Team. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think uh, AI technology can replace human completely. I do see uh, generative uh, AI such tools. Um, they are tools. Yeah. And at the end of the day, whether we are talking about businesses or we're talking about innovation, what we are doing is just, at the end of the day, we are dealing with people. Um, human are Im creatures that are very complex. We have emotions, uh, you know, our thoughts change on a second by second. We're influenced by an external stimuli. And there are many underlying uh, things that a machine, uh, AI, can't at this point in time. Uh, maybe in the f far, far future, it could be able to do it, but not now. So I, I don't see AI being able to replace the, the decision making of a human because we are very complicated creatures um, they are more than you know it's well I, I just to keep it short I, I don't think it's a near term we can see a replacement of that yeah <laughs> <laughs> but they are tools they are very useful tools yeah. like I shared before um, management should, should look at some of this kind of big data tools that can do analytics that can draw insights but you still need a human to connect the dots to Definitely. look at what are the nuances. So these are the things that uh, yeah. I think we should leverage, but I don't think they can replace human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I agree, I agree. Yeah. So yeah, we. I don't think as well that yeah. they can replace in the near, near <laughs> yes. future <Yeah. laughs> the humans. Uh, but uh, as you said, uh, you gave a very interesting point that yeah. they can definitely help yeah. to, uh, let's say, executive officers. Yeah. CEOs and uh, CEOs and other yeah. uh, C-suite uh, yes. management team to make uh, better decisions, yeah. to analyze the big data, yeah. uh, and uh, to, let's say, improve the future of the companies. Yeah. So very, it's very interesting uh, age we are living in. So yes. <laughs> let's see how it goes. So yes. the, so you you would be happy to have such, uh, let's say, technology that could help you, right, in the future, if there is one. Yeah, definitely. In yeah. fact, we are experimenting with some. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, yeah, we are using some of that to some of productivity tools. Um, sometimes I also experimented, you know, using some of these tools to write speeches, if it makes sense. Uh, yeah, but then most of the time I find that whatever they generate out, I, I still want to have my own personal flavor to it. Yeah. So I tend not to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, agree, yeah, agree. So, so the AI is uh, one of the areas uh, which is trending yeah. now. Uh, but there are other, let's say, trends and emerging mm. technologies yeah. that could change the world yeah. uh, soon. So what emerging technologies do you foresee as having the most significant impact on innovation and technology development in like coming years in the near future. Yeah. I think if I were to stretch the horizon to maybe 10 years and beyond, uh, these aren't just my personal views, not the views of IPI. I think quantum computing is something we should really pay attention to yeah. um, because it can change the way we operate. As, just give an example on digital security. Right, that is something that can shift very quickly if quantum computing become mainstream. Yep. So that's one thing that we should really pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other areas is um, how do we look at technology that can help improve the quality of life of people. Yeah. Uh, given that you know this can be anything that has got to do with uh, uh, sensors. Uh, it can also be doing like precision medicine. Um, it can also be something that addresses the changes, uh, the climate changes that we are, or I, I rather not call climate change, but climate crisis to give it a little bit more push. Um, I think every day we do see, we do hear about the effects of uh, global warming, yep. the climate is changing, the ecological system is changing. It has a very vast impact. So I, I think... Um, these are spaces I think we should 
watch out for where solutions can be found in technology can address some of this uh, very challenging um, issues that we all faced. Yep. Yeah, definitely. So within a uh, IPI team, uh, yes. management team, mm-hmm. so are you preparing to adapt and support these emerging technologies and trends? So the question is, so so you we have new technologies coming into the yeah. picture like you said uh, yes. that change will change the world yeah like quantum computing yeah. and ai yeah. so how do you uh, let's say evaluate these emerging technologies uh, that could impact to let's say smes yes. to 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 small and large companies and yeah. uh, how do you see uh, that ipi will help uh, these SMEs, for example, uh, adopt these kind of technologies. And do you think it has to be uh, mostly uh, from the companies which are built within the country or international companies can also, uh, let's say, help SMEs? Because there are, when we talk about, let's say, AI, there is a big data behind and uh, there is a security uh, issues Mm -hmm. with uh, big data. how, what do you think about this one? Right. So it's it's a it's a very good question and it's a very loaded question. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. So let me uh, put it in several parts. Um, IPI, because we deal with technology, um, my colleagues uh, spend a lot of our time um, monitoring trends, and from these trends, the key question we always ask ourselves. How are these trends relevant to the context of Singapore SME, Singapore enterprises? So from there, we will look at um, if they're relevant, then we ask ourselves this question, does it make business sense for SMEs? Yeah. And if it makes business sense, when is it going to happen? Is it going to be one year down the road, three years down the road? And how fast can this technology in terms of maturity mm. catch up with the needs, the applications so we do a lot of all this kind of uh, technology scans. We have conversation among ourselves. So how do we help to share some of this knowledge is we go th- through several channels. Uh, we do publish white paper, uh, you know, identifying this kind of opportunities uh, on and off. Uh, I mean, you may be aware that several years ago in 2019, we spotted an opportunity for lithium-ion battery recycling. That's and great, yeah. we share that through an open forum with the community and you can see the adoption comes maybe uh, in Singapore context, maybe uh, 2022, 23, you're seeing. So we are looking at that kind of horizon. So this is one thing that IPI does. Um, so I, I shared earlier, I, we, we just had a session on the opportunities on agri-food site stream virilization yesterday. So yeah. these are the way IPI uh, scan the horizon, horizon uh, spot opportunities and look at trends and we share technology that can address this opportunity with SMEs. Uh, so this is something that we do on a, a quite regular basis. Yeah. Now in terms of finding uh, technology that uh, can help address some of these uh, global challenges, we always try to find uh, what we call best fit technology for SMEs mm-hmm. because SMEs are small in nature, they are resource strapped. So we will try to find a technology that they can uh, uh, absorb, they can integrate it into their business so yeah. they can grow their top line. So that's what we have been doing and, and we have been monitoring all these trends that's out there. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting yeah. and detailed uh, yeah. explanation. So for, for the new technologies, um, when they come into the market, yeah. Uh, it can be within the country. They can come from outside. Yeah. So, uh, when when let's say SMEs and then uh, com- companies from outside, especially, they uh, wanted to collaborate and then they go through let's say IPI connection. Yeah. And but you see that technology is new yeah. and you don't have much regulation for that uh, new technology yeah. like AI. Yeah. And uh, uh, do you help? To uh, how do you help to reduce, reduce the risks of collaboration usually? Um, so what IPI does is, uh, which I did not answer your question earlier, that we we are agnostic to where the technology comes from. 
It yeah. can come from yeah. outside Singapore. It doesn't matter as long as it addresses the need of the local SMEs. Yeah. yeah. On your second question about uh, how do we uh, bring the match together, how do we mitigate the risk of adoption, I think the question is really about managing expectations, looking at what the technology is, the level of maturity, and the technology's owner's preference for collaboration. What is the mode of collaboration? Mm -hmm. And then we look at the Singapore-based company, the SMEs. What is their uh, ability? Yeah. Are they ready to have a conversation with these technology owners to be able to integrate this technology into what they have now? Yeah. So that match has to be done uh, very carefully, yeah. uh, very thoughtfully as well. Because sometimes, uh, due to the size of our companies here, they may not have the organic uh, technical knowledge to understand the technology deep enough to integrate it. So yeah. this is another job that IPI does and we try to find uh, experts, mm -hmm. technical experts, mm -hmm. who can help some of uh, our local SME uh, translate some of these signs in the product. Yeah. So as you can see, for IPI, we, we stand in the middle we are always trying to look at where are the gaps, where are the friction, mm -hmm. and try to address those friction in, in adoption of technology through our network, you know, through our services. Yeah, that's uh, really interesting how IPI uh, helps to adopt new technologies. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, definitely, uh, we will see a lot of uh, new uh, solutions are coming yeah. Yeah. to, to uh, companies from outside into Singapore, as well as from Singapore to outside yeah. countries, yes. including Southeast Asia. Yeah. So when it comes to the decision making, uh, you need to have clear mind. So it's not easy uh, when you are associate executive uh, in associate ex ex yeah. executive positions. Yeah. Uh, right decisions are highly, you know, important for company as well as for personal growth. Yeah. Uh, compared to yes. AI that makes decisions using tons of data, so yeah. we humans are less accurate when <laughs> mine yeah. is not is not clear. So mm -hmm. what do you control? Uh, I mean, like, how do you control uh, emotions, especially for clarity of mind for decision making? Mm -hmm. Right. It's, um, well, I, I don't purport to share and, and to say that I have the answer. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's, it's a learning process. Um, and, and you have rightly pointed out, um, try not to be emotional. Uh, yeah. Try to be rational. Um, I always try to go back to the basics yeah. and ask myself, when I'm making a decision, what is the objective for? Um, if it is so I will try to go back and say okay what is the end of the mind at the end of the day if the decision who does it benefit it's benefiting the company then when you go back to that basics it's very easy to make very rational uh, decisions yeah. yeah now of course we are human we are creatures of emotions I think to arrive at a reasonably sound decision I think one has to remind ourselves that always try to take the emotions out of the equation where possible. I know it's impossible all the time. And do not jump on decision-making at the heat of the moment. If yeah. you know that you are very emotionally attached to the question in mind, what I normally try to do is I try to delay the decision-making for those situations when I know I'm emotionally charged up. Yeah. Because I will... Un very highly likely make an irrational, very emotive kind of decision making, which is not very good, which yeah. tend, which means you regret some time immediately afterwards. So this is something I try to do. Um, as much as possible, where possible, uh, I will consult with my colleagues uh, and hear their views as well. Yeah. Because we are all, you know, biased by what we know, biased by what we dislike. Yeah. It's always good to hear contrarian views from others. And yeah. then when we make a decision, it's an informed decision. I think the key thing as management is once you make a decision, you own the decision. Whether it's good or bad, it doesn't matter. Right. You really have to own it. And if it is good, it's good. If it is bad, 
you just have to carry the responsibility for making a bad decision. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, do you have a special, uh, let's say, decision making style? Uh, when 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 you follow, right. yep. I mean, yep. when you have to, uh, when you need to uh, do big decisions, let's yep. say, yep. The, for the company, for mm, example, right? Uh, do you have a certain style, um, yep. or does the organization, let's say IPI, right, uh, has certain, uh, let's say, steps yes. that you need to yeah. uh, follow yep. to make this uh, yeah. significant decision that yeah. uh, changes. Mm-hmm. The IPI's future, yeah. for example, mm. as well as uh, sometimes it changes the collaboration between uh, uh, companies that are connected through IPI. Right. So I think on on a personal level, I'll answer your question in two parts. On a personal level, um, because I'm an engineer by training, I tend to be a little bit more systematic. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, I like to try to base my decision on facts, and uh, I, I think. F- And statistics, if possible, uh, because those are facts. Uh, facts. If you look at facts, you base a decision on facts. You, I believe that you you won't steer very far away from the truth, because numbers tells you the truth. They don't lie, right? So this is one part. I think when it comes to uh, making certain decisions, I tend to uh, adopt a more collaborative approach, consultative approach, um, because at the end of the day, it's just not. Uh, top-down decision because at the end of the day, I need to rally the team to work together. And within IPI, because the way we do things, there's a lot of collaborative work involved. So we need to uh, involve all the teams in getting certain things done. So I need to have the buy-in of my team. So I tend to do a lot of consultative uh, decision-making style with my colleagues, and my team. Uh, I hear their views and some many a times they give me very good views. Um, I welcome. I always tell the team I don't like yes men. Yeah. Please tell me when I'm wrong because I I'm not right all the time. Yeah. Right. So I think that is the approach I would take. Uh, in terms of within the senior management team, we also take a very uh, consultative approach. Uh, we debate with each other. We have different views. But once a decision in make is made, um, the senior management teams will fall in line and this is the decision that we have collectively made and we'll move forward in as a as a team right yeah that's a great uh that's an explanation how how you do uh decision making yeah. so uh there are many people um who are willing to who are trying to go into c suit executive positions yeah uh when they start a startup they as a founder, they become definitely one of the executive yeah. uh, in one of the exec- executive positions. Yeah. So, yeah. what would be your advice mm-hmm. to those people who right. are going into these positions, and uh, what uh, they should uh, think uh, and uh, follow so that they become? Uh, top, let's say, executive, uh, let's say, managers. For me, I'm, 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 I'm also a work in progress myself. <clears throat> yeah. I've been very fortunate, and I've been honored to be given the opportunity to be the chief operating officer of IPI. Um, I can say this: anyone who comes into the management position, um, you can prepare, you can try to learn as much as you can, but you will realize very soon, very quickly. The moment you step into that role, you'll find that you don't know many things, yeah. And you just have to uh, learn. And I think the very key thing is um, try to find a mentor, yeah, that you can fall back on, discuss, and have deep, very frank and open conversation with these mentors yeah. because they could be someone who have been there, done it. And they are able to share their experience with you, and I think it's also very important for um, someone in a management position to also have um, kind of conversation with peers, because you are in the same situation. You will probably face similar challenges 
and to hear from others and to learn from others how they approach certain challenges that they face. And there are a lot of wealth of knowledge in this kind of sharing. Um, and I think the key in, in this kind of conversation is always try to give something because everybody wants to take something. But when yeah. you give something, you'll be you know, able to receive something. So, yes. um, And I, I think as a management, I, I think the key thing is, is I always um, remind myself, you, you need to earn the respect of the team. You cannot make people follow you. Yeah. You can only earn their res- try to earn their respect yeah. and you try to gain their trust so that they willingly follow you yeah. out of their own accord. I think that is the difference between a management and a leader. A management is appointed by someone and say, yeah, you're the management. But a leader is someone who willingly ins- aspire, you know, enthuse people to follow them yeah. I think that is more important. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. As you said, it, uh, in this position, I mean, it's not like uh, you get the knowledge from the book yeah. and that's it, you are now uh, executive uh, manager. Yeah. So as you said, it, it's a life learning journey yes. and uh, you definitely uh, need some mentors. So... Uh, how many uh, mentors do you have currently? Are they in uh, different uh, areas of expertise? Mm-hmm. I'm very fortunate to be in a position where because of the work that IPI does, uh, I'm constantly in touch with many uh, SME bosses. So some of them unknowingly become my mentor because I have a lot of conversation with them, very deep conversation. Um, and I also seek their advice uh, on a regular basis on how they deal with different aspects of running businesses. So you said you are, your background is in engineering. So uh, how do you see it is, its benefits to your current uh, executive position? Uh, do you think engineering background uh, is helping a lot uh, to progress uh, your career in uh, executive positions? Well, I, I definitely having an engineering background uh, helps in a sense because engineers are trained to be very systematic. Uh, we train, we are trained by, you know, to look at statistics, look at facts, and then to derive uh, insights and answers from do- doing that. So that, that, that kind of tra- training definitely has helped me in my career. Uh, I, I think these are not traits that are common to engineers, but I believe in other disciplines, as long as you, your mind, you are as a systematic person and you rely on the facts and uh, to make decisions, I think yeah, it's good to be, uh, I mean, those are necessary traits to be a manager. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Yeah. So uh, what would you change in your career uh, if you could go back in time? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I think I'm not someone who uh, like to look back um, because there's not much, there's nothing you can do to change, you know. Right. But I, I tend to want to be someone who want to look forward, and I always believe that let's move forward. Um, you can't change the past, and leverage on what you have now. Uh, do the best with what you have, and then move forward. Yep. So this is great. So as you said, um, you are more into the future. So when we are talking about the future, uh, do you see yourself in in other positions uh, of uh, other companies? Uh, do you think you would like to try something else uh, in the uh, near future? So what would be the, uh, let's say, type of company you would be uh, you would like to be as part of and uh, what uh, area uh, that company will be functioning let's say right. it's uh, I, I get asked this question quite often <laughs> um, the, the truth is I, uh, I've enjoyed my work in IPI uh, very much um, it's the perfect job for me because I like technology and I like to marry uh, business with technology. Yeah. So if you ask me, this is the perfect job for me. Uh, I enjoy it. 
Um, so I don't think I'm going anywhere. All right. So I'm pretty happy where I am. Yeah, that's great. Definitely, uh, IPA is one of the uh, best companies who are helping to shape the innovation landscape in Singapore as well as in Southeast Asia. Uh, I would say all the best to IPI. So hoping to see uh, new collaborations uh, coming in uh, or going through IPI and uh, changing the world, not only in this region, but overall. So um, in the closing end, uh, what are your dreams regarding what you would like to see happen? And what do you think is going to happen in the field of, let's say, innovation and technology development in Singapore and beyond? And additionally, how do you anticipate the role of IPA with further uh, evolve? So the environment we are in is uh, constantly evolving. Things are very dynamic. Um, IPI, just like any other organization, is reacting to some of these changes. I think the key thing is um, IPI, like any other organization, has to constantly answer this question of how are we relevant? How can we continue to remain relevant and value-add to stakeholders? Yeah. Um, so I think that's the constant question that is uh, on everybody's mind, including uh, the senior management and IPI. So this is something we're working towards. Um, nothing is uh, business as usual. Uh, we will challenge the norm. Um, like our tagline says, we help company grow you know, beyond boundaries. And we ourselves are also constantly trying to move ourselves out of comfort zone and be as relevant as we can and to grow beyond boundaries ourselves too. Yeah, that's great. All the uh, best to your company and uh, I hope uh, you will enjoy new technologies coming uh, through the IPI and uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of collaboration that will be going through IPI and uh, all the best to the uh, collaboration and technology scouting uh, for IPI. Uh, we'll be very happy to also work with IPI uh, in near future as well. Thank you very much for coming to the podcast and uh, uh, good luck uh, and all the best in your life as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.